Hello, I'm Lewis and this is how you can make your very own giant, extendable and programmable seven segment display. I needed a very large seven segment display for a project I was working on. I couldn't find one, so I've made this. This is a very personalizable project. I've created the framework of the display and it's up to you how you program it to use it for your own needs. For example, you could use one to measure the temperature of space. Or, to display order numbers at a takeaway. Order number 7,335, please. Or, to automatically count your world record breaking press up abilities. Now this display boils down to a single modular 3D printed digit mounted onto a sheet of acrylic. This allows you to slide several of these modules together into a simple wooden frame to make a display as long as you need to. You also have the choice of programming either an Arduino Nano or ESP8266 to drive the display. Use it to show text, numbers or animations. The display is bright enough to be seen inside a bright environment and the addressable programmable LEDs are well diffused thanks to the frosted acrylic inserts. I'll show you how to make a simple version now and along the way I'll explain some simple upgrades that you can add to yours to help protect it from both bumps and high humidity. This project has been kindly sponsored by PCBWay. I'll tell you some more about them later in the video. To make one of your own you're going to need a few things. I've put links to all of them down in the description below. You'll need some filament for the 3D printed parts. I use some PETG filament from 3D Jake. A microcontroller, which can be either an Arduino Nano or a Wemos D1 Mini for added Wi-Fi and IoT control. You'll need some LEDs, about one meters worth per digit, some acrylic sheets, a five volt power supply, and to connect all of the electronics together, you can use the custom PCB I designed for this project or some Wago style connectors and direct soldering. You're also going to need some wood to make up the frame which goes around the outside of your display. I've used some common pine for mine and these are the measurements for a display frame for two characters. Now, if you want to make yours for more or less characters or if the wood that you can lay your hands on is of a different thickness, then I've created this cheat sheet which you can download from my website, diymachines.co.uk which will help you to figure out the correct lengths that you'll need to cut your wood at for the frame. Some optional upgrades, which I will be adding to personalize my one, which is destined for the swimming pool, include a radio receiver and a matching four button key fob transmitter, some wooden dowels to help reinforce the mitre joints in the corners of our frame, some water resistant LEDs and some finishing oil for the wood. Now the first part that we can 3D print for our project are these light tubes. You're going to need seven of these for each of your characters on your display. As mentioned, I printed mine in PETG with a 0.3 millimeter layer height as detail is not important as they won't be seen. We'll be attaching these to our acrylic sheets later. You have two different options for these sheets of acrylic. The easiest one is to use a single sheet of frosted acrylic and attach your 3D printed light tunnels directly to the back of it. The downside of this is that your characters on the front will have an ever so slightly blurred outline. Here is an example I made to show you. For the crisper edges that you saw in the demonstration, I took a sheet of opaque acrylic, cut out each of the segments in its front and into these cutouts, insert some pieces of translucent frosted acrylic. To make my cutouts, I used a Snapmaker desktop CNC machine. 
You can also make the cutouts by printing the template from my website. Transfer these markings to the acrylic sheet And then use either a small handheld router such as a Dremel or drill a hole and thread a hacksaw or similar through it to make the cutouts by hand. By the way, I've also included the DXF drawings for both the cutouts and inlays suitable for a one and a half millimeter router bit in the download section on my website if you'd like to use those as well. To fit the inlays, we can simply glue them into place flush with the front of the acrylic sheet. Super glue from the reverse side will do fine for most applications where the acrylic will not be put under any particular physical stresses. Now as this clock will be going up on pool side it's likely to be hit by balls during water polo matches and pool parties. So I'm going to be using some extra fix to chemically weld the acrylic inserts to the acrylic frame. Now, if you're going to be doing the same, and this goes for any of the tools or chemicals in this project, make sure you read the safety sheet. Extra fix is very good at its job, but it's also fairly nasty stuff. To use it properly, you'll need your acrylic pieces to be fitted tightly and then you run a small bead along the edges using a wide bore needle. Once the glue or solvent has fully cured, we can start to attach our 3D printed light tubes. For most builds, some super glue or some hot melt glue will do just fine. For this, you just need to run a small length along the underside of your 3D printed part and then hold it in place over the segment for about 30 seconds whilst it initially grabs. For the pool side version, I'm going to be using a polyurethane glue because it's a much stronger hold. For this to work, you'll need to lightly scuff the edges of the digits so that the glue can mechanically lock into the surface of our acrylic sheet. I used some very coarse grit sandpaper for this. So polyurethane glues set in the presence of water. So I lightly sprayed the top of the acrylic sheet with some plain old tap water before applying the glue sparingly to the bottom of the light tube and bringing the two together. Don't forget that the polyurethane glue will expand three to four times its size as it cures, so use it sparingly. Leave this under a stack of weights to ensure a very good bond is created. Whilst we wait for this glue to cure, we'll leave it alone in this room and we'll go start work on our four sides of the wooden box frame. <laughs> To make the frame to go around our display, I'm going to be using some common pine from the Builders Merchant, which measures 20 millimeters thick and 68 millimeters in width. If you can't find the exact same dimension, that's not a problem. Just pop over to my website and I've made a little cheat sheet which will explain what lengths you need to cut yours to based on the thickness of your wood and how many characters you want to display. Now for my 20 millimeter thick wood, I need to cut two pieces, which are 381 millimeters long, and then another two lengths, which are 440 millimeters long. To this, we need to add a rebate. This will hide our cut edges and allow us some wiggle room in our sizes. This rebate should be five millimeters deep and as wide as your acrylic, five millimeters again in my case. It also wants to be set back by about 10 millimeters from the front of the wood. I made my rebates by taking several passes on a table saw. The ends should then also be mitered at a 45 degree angle so that the rebate is running on the shortest edge. You can use either a miter saw or a hand saw for this job. If you are going to be using more than just a single character in your display, I've created this H-shaped profile which you can 3D print and use to join together the separate pieces of acrylics and hide any possible gaps. For mine, I printed two that are 170 millimeters long each. We can now begin to assemble our wooden frame around the outside of our acrylic pieces. Now, we'll be gluing the mitres of the four corners together. And as this cut could almost be considered the end grain of our wood, it's a good idea to mix some of your wood glue with water in a 50-50 ratio 
and apply this to the ends first. Let this soak into the grain as this end of the wood is going to be thirsty and then we'll come back around and add a neat solution before that dries and clamp everything tightly together. I'm going to be using a band clamp to hold mine together. If you don't have one, you can 3D print some corner caps and use an old belt, ratchet strap, clamps, weights, or any other method that you can rustle up together. You should remove any of the excess wood glue that squeezes out of the mitres when you clamp it together. This is especially true for the inside corners here at the front of our display, as it will be most difficult to sand these areas later. Let this dry overnight to ensure it has plenty of strength before we move on to the next step. Now our wooden frame is plenty strong enough as it is for most use cases. But to toughen this one further, I'm going to use some wooden dowels across these mitres in the corners. This is a simple but effective way to add some strength to our frame. To do this, you're going to need some wooden dowel rod. I'm using this six millimeter wide birch wood. You're also going to need to drill a hole across the corner of our mitre. For this, you'll need a drill bit the same diameter as your rod, six millimeters again in my case. To help drill the holes at an angle without a jig, start the drill perpendicular to the surface of the wood and then after the hole has begun, you can then tilt the drill to the 45 degree angle and continue drilling all the way through. Once this is done, cut off a length of dowel slightly longer than the hole. Apply wood glue to the hole and dowel before inserting it. You'll likely need to use a hammer to persuade it all the way through the joint. Wipe away any excess glue and repeat for all four of your corners. Allow this to dry for about an hour or more and then we can then saw off the dowel close to the surface and once dry, sand it flush. Just before we move on to our electronics, I'd like to say thank you to my Patreons. That's this list of super lovely people passing by now. I'd also like to thank both 3D Jake for providing the filament used in the project and Trent Plastic for donating the acrylic sheets. If you'd like to join them in supporting this and future project videos, then take a look at my Patreon page and thank you for your support. Let's work on our electronics now, starting with our LEDs. If you're making a more water resistant version, then you should opt for the IP rated strips of addressable LEDs. For every character that you'll be putting into your display, you're gonna to need to cut yourself seven lengths of eight LEDs from the roll, making sure you cut across the cutting guides marked on the strips. Then all three pads at the end of each strip should be tinned with solder to make adding wires to them much easier shortly. Join the strips into one long length. Use a trio of four centimeter long wires between each of them. As you join your segments of LED strips into sets of seven, make sure you pay particular attention to the directional arrows on the LEDs. This shows the direction that the data flows across our strip. Now the power connections at either end of our strips of LEDs should also have some 30 centimeter wires attached to them. We only need to attach a single 30 centimeter long wire to the incoming data line. We don't need to add one on the outgoing side. We'll be connecting the power at both ends of our characters to help reduce the effects of voltage drop, which will show itself in our LEDs as being slightly dimmer and leaning towards the warmer hues of color. We can now print the LED mounts, seven for each of your characters. 
If you're using the LED strips enclosed in silicone, then you should print the version with loops. This is because the silicone rubber is one of the most challenging materials to bond, so we'll hold those strips in place mechanically instead. Now, if you're using the non-waterproof variety, then you can use the self-adhesive backing that are on the LED strips. Now, if you have more than just the one character, like I do in my display, then you'll need to connect the incoming data line of one of your strips to the outgoing line of your other strips. Of course, if you have more than just the two characters, then you should keep this string of data line passing through each of your segments of LEDs. And also, if you're going to be using the water resistant LED strips like I have, add some copious amounts of hot melt glue in both ends to help seal them up and keep humidity from out of inside the plastic tubes. You can now go about attaching our strings of LEDs to the rear of our frame using some M3 by six or longer bolts. Now they need to be added in a particular order as shown here. You now have the choice between using either an Arduino Nano or ESP8266 to control your project. Both have their own pros and cons, but briefly, you should use the Arduino Nano if you want to keep your costs as low as possible, if you prefer to work with something you're more familiar with, and you don't require Wi-Fi control. Opt for the ESP8266 if you would like the Wi-Fi control, so you can connect it to things such as Blink's IoT service. If you want to control more than just six digits, as the brains inside the Nano will struggle to buffer that much LED data. You might also want to use the features of ESP Now so that you can connect several of these together ad hocly using their Wi-Fi chips. I have decided to use an Arduino Nano to control my poolside lap timer and I'll also be adding a radio frequency receiving module so that the users of the pool can control it remotely. I have already written some code for both controllers which will turn them into the giant lap timers I keep talking about. Now without the radio module attached it will just continuously count from 0 to 60 seconds and then loop back round and start again. If you have connected a radio module like mine then the four buttons each perform a different action. Now, I strongly encourage you to have a go at writing some code of your own and turn your display into whatever you want or need it to be. I'll also maintain a directory on my website of other people's code which you can look to for inspiration or maybe you'll find just the thing you need already written for you. To upload the project's code to your microcontroller, you need to connect it to your computer using a USB cable and then download the code from the repository on GitHub. Open it in the Arduino IDE and select the correct board type and port for your controller. Install any libraries that are required of the scripts and then press upload and wait a few seconds. Once this is complete, we can disconnect the microcontroller and set about connecting the remainder of our electronics together. I've designed this PCB for the project. It can accommodate either an Arduino Nano or a Wemos D1 Mini and Logic Level Converter. There's also a space at the end to add the optional radio frequency receiver. It's got suitably wide power traces on it to power the electronics on the board and up to two characters worth of LEDs. You'll find that this little board will make your wiring much simpler and more reliable. I had mine fabricated at PCBWay and had it produced with this lovely matte black silkscreen. I think it's pretty smart. In the description below is a link to where you can order this design direct from the project's page on PCBWay's website. I've already preloaded all of the design and settings for you. If you're a new customer to PCBWay, they also have a promotion where you can get $5 towards your first order. And as a set of five PCBs for this project only costs $5 at the moment, you effectively only need to pay for the shipping. 
They also have delivery options starting from as little as around $9 or if you're in a hurry, try their express DHL shipping. I've done this before and some PCBs that I ordered on Monday arrived with me here in the UK by Thursday morning. That's pretty impressive. If you don't want to use a PCB, that's not a problem either. I've also created this wiring diagram, which you can find on my website, which will explain to you how you can connect the electronics using simple connectors such as Wago connectors and some direct soldering or any other method you think is suitable. A link to both the PCB basket and that wiring diagram are in the details down below. Now the power supply for your project will need to provide five volts and about one and a half amps per character if you think there's a chance that you'll have all the segments lit up at full brightness at any point. Now you've got several options for how you can connect this power supply. Perhaps the simplest one is to use a female barrel connector and mount this into your frame by drilling a hole in the side of the wood, inserting the barrel connector and then using some thicker wires to attach this to the rest of your electronics. Next is to use a power supply with direct wires connected to some Wago style connectors. From these, you can then distribute the power to your controllers and to the LEDs themselves on each character. Now, if you'll be using two characters or less, you'll also have the option of using USB power, which will make your project more mobile. Now, at two characters, you probably will only be able to run them at about 80% brightness, but with a single character, shine as much as you want to. And one more possibility is to wire the power wires from your power supply directly to the PCB itself. This is what I will be doing for my poolside one as it reduces the amount of electrical components and connections exposed to the humid environment. If you're going to be using a lot of characters in your display, then don't forget that a lot of LEDs can draw an awful lot of current. So you're going to need to use an appropriately thick power wire between your power supply and your choice of power distribution. Now, if you're unsure how to calculate the power draw or the correct wire thickness, then I strongly encourage you to speak to someone who does. Whilst we still have our soldering iron turned on, we can add our microcontroller of choice to the PCB. Now, this could be the Arduino Nano or the ESP8266. If you're adding this though, don't forget you'll need to add the logic level converter. This is because this microcontroller puts out signals at 3.3 volts, whereas our LEDs need to see a five volt signal. The Arduino already operates at five volts. Next, we'll attach the data wire going to our first LED on our display. For me, that's this white one here. And to my one, so that I can control it using that remote fob, I'll also be adding the radio frequency receiving module. We can now collect all the positive wires going to and from our LEDs and attach this to the top row of the PCB and all the negative wires can be attached to the second row down. Now that we have our electronics connected, microcontroller programmed and LEDs wired, let's plug in the power and see what happens. And now that we know that our seven segment display is working as intended, we can enclose our electronics in a small 3D printed case. I've designed this one here, which will fit the PCB I made for the project, as well as accommodate the optional radio frequency receiver if you're using it. For this, the PCB is simply screwed into place and then the lid is screwed in on top of this. If you are after a more moisture resistant finish, then you could consider using one of these IP rated box and modifying it to hold your electronics. I'm going to use my 3D printed one and add to it something called magic gel. This is a non-dialectic gel, meaning it doesn't conduct electricity once it's set, that will seal all of my components and help further protect them from the moisture of a swimming pool environment. 
The case can then be glued into position on the back of our display. To help bring a nice finish to my frame and add some additional moisture resistance, I applied several coats of boiled linseed oil following the instructions on the back of the packet. To demonstrate, this is a treated piece of wood reacting with water and this one is an untreated piece of the same wood type. Now I would love to see how you use or adapt this project to suit your own needs, so do feel free to send in some photos or publish your builds online. This one is going to find its way now down to the local swimming club. Thank you so much for watching this project, I hope you've enjoyed it and until next time do some good and ciao for now. To do this you're going to need some wooden dowel wad, wad, <laughs> rod to join these lovely people and companies in supporting my next you need to cut yourself eight strip seven not eight <laughs> damn it